Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to please find your seats, and while you're at it, please find your cell phones so that you can silence them or turn them off so they do not interrupt this evening's program. Thank you very much, and we'll begin momentarily. It's magic. The music just stops, right? Hey, so uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Mike Bell, the executive director of the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. And thanks for everyone who's uh, here with us and everybody who's uh, joining in from home. You know, we really appreciate the, the opportunity. And those that watch this uh, later, uh, you, you really miss something great in person. So, uh, you know, first, as we start out uh, a museum tradition, as we acknowledge any World War II veterans, or home front workers or Holocaust survivors in the audience, uh, whether in person or online. And I don't think we have any in person, but let's, uh, for those that uh, are home watching, let's give them a round of appreciation, a round of applause. <laughs> and then next, uh, you know, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to recognize veterans of any era. So if you'd please stand so we can recognize you. And, and, and just stay standing for a second. And any, uh, any veteran spouses, since that's the, the, the toughest job sometimes is to be a veteran spouse. Any spouses with us this evening? Yeah. So thanks, thanks for that. And uh, now I also want to just uh, give a shout out to some uh, distinguished individuals uh, here with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Nick Mueller, our founding president and CEO Emeritus. You know, thanks for sharing that glass of sherry with uh, Dr. Ambrose and coming up with the idea for a National World War II Museum. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, incredibly exciting. And then uh, one of our trustees, Robert Pretty, and his wife Kiki. Thank you very much. You guys are wonderful. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Marcus Cox of Xavier University. Where is Marcus? There he is. He's uh, a, new, uh, a new fellow at the Jenny Craig Institute. So uh, Marcus, uh, it's great to have you. And then uh, while we're welcoming people, uh, soon to join the Institute, uh, Dr. John Crotola. Uh, John, welcome aboard. I love it when they exist in person. You can, you know, now they're, they're here. So. Uh, but we also have a group of uh, 20 young, at least younger than me, 
uh, PhDs, they really are the future of our field. And uh, they're here in the second of three weeks for our summer seminar on military history. And uh, this is an incredible partnership with the Society for Military History. And, you know, fellows, let's uh, just, why don't you stand up and let's uh, give you a round of applause as well. You know, I, I think the great thing is the fellows actually had to work harder than some of them thought they were going to, you know, be working this week. So, incredible application, and I think, you know, frankly, as the plank holders for this new program, you know, thanks for the energy you put into that. It's been great. And, of course, uh, the tour guide for this week is uh, Dr. Greg Dattis, our summer seminar program director, a uh, distinguished scholar on the Vietnam War, retired military officer. So, Greg, let's give you a round of applause as well. <laughs> thanks, brother. Now, the, the, the General Raymond D. Mason, Jr. Distinguished Lecture Series on World War II is devoted to the legacy of America's largest war. Our speakers have included writers, scholars, distinguished members of the armed forces, and journalists. And the lecture series is open to the public at no cost uh, through the generosity of Major General and Mrs. Raymond D. Mason, Jr. and the Raymond D. Mason Foundation. Now, General Mason served in the European Theater of Operations during World War II in the 4th Armed Division, uh, part of uh, General George Patton's 3rd Army. And then prior to retiring from the military in 1976, at the end of a long and illustrious career, he held several high-ranking uh, Pentagon positions, including the Assistant Deputy Chief for Operations and the Special Assistant to the Deputy Chief of Logistics. Now, tonight, uh, as part of this uh, General Mason series. We're joined by Sir Ron Emitter. Kind of cool. Had to say that. Professor of History and Politics of Modern China and is a Department of Politics and International Relations and Faculty of History Fellow at St. Cross College and the University of Oxford. And uh, his work focuses on the emergence of nationalism in China through the early 20th century through the present. And in 2019, he was appointed Officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire for his services to education. So pretty cool. I don't think we're going to get that one. But uh, and, and joining us in this conversation tonight is our own uh, Dr. Steph Hinerschitz, a senior historian here at the National World War II Museum's Jenny Craig Institute. Uh, Steph has published uh, three books and multiple articles on topics related to Asian American history and the home front during World War II. And, uh, Steph now has a, an, another approved book project, uh, which is pretty impressive, uh, as she continues to crank out the scholarship and ad advance the knowledge. But uh, So the opportunity this night, uh, Steph's going to join the discussion uh, with Professor Mitter on his two most recent books, Forgotten Ally and China's War. And so with that, it's my pleasure to call to the stage Dr. Rana Mitter and Dr. Steph Hinerschitz. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction, and thank you, Rana, for being here with us tonight. I wanted to start off by discussing your first book, Forgotten Ally. And I will say I am terrible with thinking of titles for my books. <laughs> I think your title for your book kind of says it all. So Forgotten Ally, I want to ask you what inspired you to write this book? When you were doing your research, when you were doing reading, what is it that made you feel like this was a book that needed to be written? Steph, thanks very much, not only for the question, but also for the chance to be here along with all of those who made it possible for those of us who were kept out by you know, the troubles of the last two years to return to the museum. It's wonderful to see it back uh, in full form again, having been online for, for far too long, but uh, great to, to be back in person. And the question about why Forgotten Ally was a book that I really felt compelled to write. As you say, in a sense, is captured by the, the title. So some may know or some may not, but just briefly to, to, to explain. The book is an account of perhaps the best known event in modern history, which is of course World War II. And we're all concerned with that here in the, uh, the museum uh, gathered here. But perhaps the, the major theater of that which is the least well-known, at least to a Western audience. And that is China's participation in the war, uh, for the most part, but not exclusively, against uh, 
Japan. And in this particular case, it seemed to me as someone who spent my life studying Chinese history, that this was a huge, great, relative blank in the way in which our understanding of the global war has been understood. So to give just two quick examples um, of why I thought this was an important topic to, to undertake. I mean, first of all, I should say there are many, many very fine scholarly studies of various elements of China's World War II, both in Chinese and indeed in Japanese, but also in, in English. But most of them are quite specific operational studies or their studies of particular aspects of that war, rather than trying to, to tell the, the wider full story. And it's a story worth telling. This is a theater of war which lasted longer than any other theater of World War II, starting in 1937, 7th of July, 1937, the outbreak of war between the Japanese and the Chinese at the Marco Polo Bridge, just outside uh, Beijing, and ending, of course, in, in 1945. It involved millions of deaths, uh, just one, I hesitate to call it an incident, but uh, um, event, perhaps, is the right, uh, the right word, the famine that was caused in Henan province in China during the war and directly because of it alone, that famine killed four million people and many other millions died during that, that time. And also a massive refugee crisis that shaped the, um, uh, shaped the, um, the, the progress of the war during that, that time. So in terms of sheer statistics, and we shouldn't forget that of course, more than half a million Japanese troops were held down for four and a half years between 37 and 41 before the arrival of the Americans and the Brits, of course, at Pearl Harbor. But just as a final thought on why I think it needed to be written, it also provides an intriguing counterfactual because in year one of the war for China, and bearing in mind this is before the war in Europe even breaks out fully, in 1938, many people, including American and British observers, thought that China's then lone fight against the Japanese, which had been raging for a year, would have to come to an end. Uh, it simply wasn't possible, they thought, for the Chinese to maintain their battle against the Japanese. If they had, in fact, surrendered, if the nationalist Chinese under Chiang Kai-shek, the communists under Mao Zedong, had decided to lay down arms, then China would probably have become a sort of Japanese colony or a satrapy. But the whole history of the global war would be different. Because if China had surrendered in 1938, you don't get Pearl Harbor. If you don't get Pearl Harbor, you don't get the story that we now know of a European war against Hitler and an Asian war being brought together in a global war, which is commemorated not least in this museum. So China's war, of course, matters to the Chinese, but actually it matters a great deal to the rest of us who are concerned about the legacy of that global war as well. There are quite a few figures and events that you bring up in Forgotten Allies that I think for, or Forgotten Ally, my bad, um, that most readers or most people who in a Western audience are familiar with World War II probably didn't know of. So Chang, Mao, these are all names that are pretty familiar, but are, is there any figure that you found in your research for this book that more people should know about in order to understand this chapter of history that you're trying to shed more light on? Steph, I think there are definitely figures who should be brought back into a wider consideration of the war. I'll just mention one because he's perhaps someone who's whose name and reputation is still in the shadows of public perception in the West, but hasn't much been thought about in recent years, and that is Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek was the uh, recognized leader of China during the 1930s and 40s. Um, he's famous, if he's famous at all these days, for a protracted and ultimately unsuccessful war against his communist opponents within China, which he lost in a civil war that ended uh, in 1949. But what's forgotten is that it was his decision that the war against Japan would have to take place and that he couldn't continue essentially to, to use a word we know from the European uh, uh, context, appease continued Japanese encroachment on Chinese territory in the 1920s and 30s that really set the, um, uh, set the war off in China. And the reason that I think that he should be remembered, one of the things I explore somewhat in the book, is that 
although his reputation has ended up being as a leader who is essentially incompetent, corrupt, someone who didn't find themselves um, really um, uh, at the forefront of anyone who considered to be a serious war leader, if you look in detail at the decisions he had to make without the benefit of hindsight, his attempt to essentially keep China fighting while trying to find allies from anywhere. He tried the Soviet Union first. He was a fierce anti-communist. But if the Soviets would have stopped the Japanese invading China, then he would have worked with them. Then, of course, ultimately, we know it was, in fact, the United States and indeed the British Empire that he worked with. But he was someone who took a very, very weak hand of cards and played them with much more skill than has been realized. And that doesn't mean that he deserves a hagiography. He was flawed in many, many ways. But he's also worth remembering as a war leader who made a significant contribution to the overall World War II experience. When you're thinking about a figure like Chang and you're trying to get at some of these more forgotten parts of this aspect of World War II history, what, how did you go about getting at that particular topic? So what sources did you have to go to? What challenges did you have to confront when trying to reconstruct this part of a narrative that has largely been forgotten for many people who are familiar with this war? Well, the first thing I should mention, Steph, is that if I've given any impression that I was able to sort of carve this story out of the hewn rock, then I have to abandon that now because I was very dependent, first of all, on the pioneering work of some of the small but significant number of Western scholars who have taken this work uh, forward. And I want to mention in particular uh, Hans van der Ven of Cambridge University who taught me um, and whose book, actually, China at War, 1937-252, which looks at a whole stretch of wars, including the Second World War, but also uh, the Chinese Civil War and Korea, is definitely one of the, the masterpieces of military writing in, in recent, on, on Asia in, in recent years. But also, I have consistently said that it's the West that has tended not to think about this war. In China itself, of course, there has been a huge explosion, particularly in the 40 years of the so-called reform period, in other words, the years after the death of Chairman Mao and the relative opening up of the Chinese academic sphere, in which a whole variety of materials have been made available by Chinese scholars, both for themselves and for their foreign um, uh, partners who are able to work with them. So for those who are interested, for instance, in what happens on the battlefield, it's now become much more possible to get hold of um, operational materials, to get hold of uh, strategic documents that give some idea of what the various sides, uh, the nationalists and the communists, thought they were doing. And also, actually, to understand some of the more shadowy and gray side of that, uh, that conflict. And what I mean by that is the often forgotten fact that a significant number of Chinese, as in France, actually worked with the Japanese rather than as nationalist Chinese. And those materials also have become available. So for me, again, just to give one example, one of the most fascinating documents, which had been published in Chinese a while ago, but not much used, was a diary of a man named Zhou Fohai, who was a sort of second in command to Wang Jingwei, who was the Pierre Laval, or Quisling, or Pétain, of the Chinese war effort. In other words, the senior figure who worked with the Japanese. And reading a day-by-day -day diary of one of his ministers, you get an idea, you don't have to clearly sympathize, but you can have some idea of why he and he, those working with him chose to make this, even for them at the time, very, very difficult decision that the fate of China was so dire that they would actually throw in their lot with the enemy, as they thought it, uh, as they thought of it, in, a hope, uh, in the hope of trying to prevent the bombing and the destruction of China at that time. And that's a story that even in China today is very, very difficult to tell. It doesn't fit into the overall heroic narrative of the, of the war. So being able to, able to uncover, translate, and use materials like that was a really exciting part of the process for me. Great. And there's also other figures that I think many of us would be more familiar with who appear in Forgotten Alley and your retelling of this war. So one that I thought was interesting is uh, Vinegar Joe Stilwell. So it's really interesting to learn about him and his role through this sort of different angle that you take. Could you, could you say a little bit about that and what that means to the story that you're trying to tell to an audience that might not be as familiar with this particular aspect? Yeah, let me say a little bit about um, General Vinegar Joe Stilwell. And again, I have to pay tribute to uh, Hans van der Ven of Cambridge, who was the first Western scholar really to have done a revisionist account of Stilwell and his military role. 
He was the American chief of staff to the Chinese Nationalist Army under Chiang Kai-shek during the period of the alliance after Pearl Harbor between essentially 1942 and 1945. And that in itself, if you think about it, is actually a really rather strange and interesting occurrence because for a sovereign state, which China certainly was, an allied power, to essentially have a chief of staff, a, com sorry, a commander in chief, who was American and not Chinese, was in and of itself a very unusual sort of uh, occurrence. And Stilwell himself, who kept a very extensive diary, noted this. He actually said, in a way that was sort of typical of his, sort of his uh, kind of uh, rather acid New England tone, uh, can't be easy for Chiang Kai-shek to hand over his armies to a goddamn foreigner. So uh, there was a certain amount of self-awareness there. But essentially, a section of my book called The Toxic Alliance, the, the clue again is in the title. <laughs> it, let's just say it doesn't end well. During that time, an essential clash began to emerge between the two principal players. Chiang Kai-shek, president of China and leader of the Chinese war effort, who, as he pointed out, had been leading China essentially for all intents and purposes, alone against the Japanese for four and a half years, and a, an American general coming in with very fixed, very, very um, different ideas about what a successful military campaign is going to be, and the two of them clash. They clash essentially about Burma, a campaign which I know probably several people here have some knowledge and expertise um, on, but that first Burma campaign in 1942, if you're, a Chang, if you're still well, you basically think that you're trying to recapture Burma from the Japanese, and it goes wrong in part because the Chinese troops are not well trained enough and are basically being subverted by Chiang Kai-shek. If you're Chiang Kai-shek, you're basically looking horrified as some of your very best troops are being taken by this American to basically launch a kind of campaign of recapture of a country which isn't even your own and which you don't think is actually going to be successfully recaptured anytime very soon. And from this clash in terms of strategic outlook, you then get the increasing sense that neither of these two men understands or sympathizes with or can get on with each other. And again, the parallel experience of reading Stilwell's diary in English and Chiang Kai-shek's diary in Chinese, where the two of them are railing against each other, shows just how toxic, how divided this vitally important command structure actually was at that time. Great, thank you. Going back to your title again, so I'm gonna keep going back to your title because it's so great. So the forgotten part of that, how does that happen? So everything that you describe, China's role in this war as an ally, the internal struggles that it is dealing with while it's also at war, what, how is it forgotten? How does this narrative sort of play out? What happens to it? How is it, how is it possible that there can be so many people who have this general understanding of the war, but this part has, has been forgotten. It seems strange that such a titanic conflict could simply be forgotten, yet I would say it was forgotten on two sides, and that's the reason I think that the title, to me, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because it was forgotten by mu much of the Western world. The China theater, and as much as it was remembered, was remembered as this sort of slightly secondary, not terribly important um, field, certainly subsumed to the much bigger story of the Pacific War which of course is related to the China theater, but is not by any means the same thing. Uh, and if you don't believe that, just ask any Chinese. However, the Chinese themselves, or at least in the mainland of China, as opposed to Taiwan, also forgot about the story. So on the part of the West, I think that essentially it was put on the back burner because the Chinese commander at the time, Chiang Kai-shek, ended up being this slightly embarrassing right-wing Cold War figure who people didn't really want to be associated with, particularly after Nixon's opening to China in the uh, 70s, more than 50 years ago now. That proved to be a part of history which didn't really fit into the wider narrative of America's presence in Asia. But the communist Chinese under Mao after 1949 also had no interest in remembering that story. The reason for that was very simple. In 1949, when Mao's Chinese Communist Party conquered the mainland and established the People's Republic of China, which still exists today, they wanted to make it clear that it wasn't just a political victory, it was a victory of right over wrong, good over bad. And in that context, Chiang Kai-shek, who had been exiled to Taiwan, never to be seen on the mainland uh, again after 1949, 
had to be portrayed as someone with no redeeming, no redeeming qualities at all. So the idea that his period as wartime leader against the Japanese did actually have elements of genuine resistance, uh, that he had been commander-in-chief in a very, very difficult period um, when there was simply very few options open to China, and he'd played these weak hands better than many people had thought, um, that the nationalist armies that he had commanded had actually done most of the battlefield fighting as opposed to the guerrilla fighting for which the communists were known. In other words, this more nuanced picture of who had contributed what to the Chinese war effort, all of this had to be wiped out for a much more simplistic story that the Chinese communists were the only people who had fought the Japanese in a way that was worth remembering. And it's worth noting that this wasn't untrue. Uh, well, it was not untrue that the Chinese communists had indeed fought very bravely against the Japanese, but the idea that they had done so without the nationalists, without the Americans, without the British, was, of course, only a very partial story. And that's why, in the mainland, that story was forgotten, really, until the 1980s or 90s. Thank you. There's also a really great way that you frame your book, Forgotten Alley in the Introduction, and that's trying to shift, at least for historians, but I think for the public too, trying to shift from asking the question of who lost China to how did the war change China. So that, to me, seems like a pretty important framing device for your book. Is that, is that safe to say that you're also intervening in this bigger discussion about the Cold War and how that has shaped our, the way we remember China's role in the war? Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, Steph, because I think that is a very important distinction. You get to the same end point, inevitably, as a historian. You have the uh, victory of Mao Zedong and the communists on the mainland of China in 1949. But the, I think, misleading and very sterile debate that existed in the 50s and still pops up now and then in some context today, subsumed under the question, who lost China, makes, I think, a very misleading assumption, which was that China's was someone else's to lose, that it belonged to the West and the United States, or that it belonged to the Soviet Union or whichever uh, um, particular actor you think is doing the losing or the winning. One of the things that approaching that war from the Chinese side, through the Chinese materials, even amongst clashing parties, nationalists, communists, um, collaborationists, and others, makes it clear that in the end, it was about the dynamics of what was gonna happen to the Chinese people and what they created for themselves. Of course, the Americans and the Soviets had a role, a very important one, but nonetheless, it was in the end a decision that was for China itself. And if you change the question to how did it change China, but I think it is possible to argue, and actually should be argued quite strongly, that the downfall of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government comes for a variety of reasons, but having to fight this huge war against Japan for eight years, more than half of it without formal allies, and in a way which essentially threw huge amounts of China's resources, um, energy, uh, young men, uh, food, uh, the uh, uh, ability to actually maintain an economy that wasn't inflationary, all of the things which a stable peacetime society could normally maintain were essentially sacrificed for the one goal of keeping the war going against the Japanese. And that did change China, because it created the atmosphere that allowed a much more radical, much more ultimately violent social revolution to take place, which we now know, of course, as the revolution undertaken by Chairman Mao. It's not to say that China might not have had that kind of revolution had there not been a war against Japan, but I think that the war against the Japanese radicalized society in a way that did ultimately create the circumstances for a communist victory. Thank you. The other, the, another thing that is interesting in your book is you have another great line where even though the title is Forgotten Ally, you say, China's legacy in the war is all over if you know where to look. And so I thought that was an, an excellent way to also kind of flow into your next book, China's Good War. So is that what inspired you to write China's Good War, this idea that it's forgotten, but if, as long as you know where to look, and if you look at these different cultural aspects, is that something that inspired you to continue your studies? Um, very much so, Steph. So perhaps I should briefly explain the title, because the title China's Good War is meant to be an allusion to a book that, again, I think many people who come to this museum and are perhaps are sitting here today will know, and that's Studs Terkel's classic The Good War, which was published you know, about 40 years ago now. And again, many of you will know that it is a title, that, well, it's a book that 
recounts the experience of many who served in, uh, on the American side in World War II, but also the title is meant to be at least partly ironic, because of course it wasn't that the war itself was good in any way for many of the people who uh, fought in it, but rather that it became used as a war that could be portrayed as morally good for a just cause, to some extent in contrast with the Vietnam War that followed, which became much more morally problematic for a variety of reasons that we all know. And so I was making a play on that title by calling this book China's Good War, because my argument would certainly not be that World War II for China was good in any sense whatsoever, but rather that China too has picked up on the idea of World War II as a war that's useful in terms of helping the China of today define what it is and how it portrays itself in the world. So to give a couple of quick examples of what I meant when I said that World War II is around in China if you know where to, uh, where to look. One of the things that is most uh, notable about popular culture in China, even today, is that World War II experiences still draw a tremendous amount of popular attention. So in the year 2020, we all know, of course, it's the first year of the pandemic, uh, but actually movie theaters were open in China. And the film that topped the box office there, and actually I think was therefore technically the world's best-selling film in terms of tickets in 2020, was a movie called The 800, uh, which is definitely worth seeing if you get a chance to do it. I think it'll be available with sub subtitles on streaming services. And it involves the story, uh, based on uh, a true story, of a small group of Chinese soldiers making a last stand at the beginning of the, the war against Japan in 1937 in a warehouse in Shanghai. And the film became very controversial in China because when it was, it was about to be, it was supposed to be released in 2019, but was actually banned at the last minute because the soldiers who are portrayed in it are not communist soldiers, they're nationalists, Chiang Kai-shek soldiers. And it was felt by a variety of people close to the Communist Party that this film could not be released, particularly in a year which was going to be the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. A year later, though, you had VJ Day plus 75. And that did prove a moment when this you know, very, very expensive film, it cost about $80 million to make. Uh, uh, it was not a sort of underground dissident production in any sense whatsoever, was released and found this huge audience in China of very, very large numbers of people who felt somehow that this story of a small number of young men, you know, potentially sacrificing themselves in the face of an outside enemy mattered more to them than the fact that the protagonists were actually from the party which ultimately was the enemy of the Chinese Communist Party itself. So I'd say that one of the uses that World War II has in contemporary China, and has had actually over the last 30 or 40 years, is to provide what you might call, kind of call it a moderated or regulated pathway for some people to tell a different story about who the Chinese nation are, which is not at 180 degrees difference to what the Communist Party says in Beijing, but what you might say is at 90 degrees angle to it, a sort of different light shed on what actually makes up that much broader idea of the Chinese nation state and the World War II experience is useful to do that. You also talk a lot about all the different ways when it comes to culture, to how this narrative plays out. And one thing that I also thought was really interesting, you discuss younger members of the Chinese population who have no direct connection to World War II, or they didn't live through it, they're not, you know, they're maybe their grandparents or whoever, but there's no direct connection there. But they're finding something to draw on from that, and I think, Know, being in this museum, the power of nostalgia, you certainly discuss that a lot. So can you explain that a little bit more and talk about what role that has played for even younger Chinese people and how they sort of cling to the war or use the war for a certain narrative or purpose? Sure. Let me give you a specific example, Stephanie. It's one of the ones that I found most interesting. Um, for many years, uh, certainly through the 2000s and into the 2010s, one of the most famous uh, talk show hosts in China has been a man named Cui Yongyuan. Um, he's of the level, I mean, you know, 
for an earlier generation, kind of level of Johnny Carson, um, you know, today, sort of Stephen Colbert, you know, that sort of level of fame in China. He doesn't actually have a show on Chinese TV now, partly because he keeps getting sued for stuff. He got, um, he basically accused China's most famous movie actress, uh, a woman called Fan Bingbing, of having cheated her taxes, uh, which the, turns out the Chinese Communist Party agreed that she had, which was rather un unfortunate, but it didn't make him very popular in various cir circumstances. Anyway, the reason I bring him up is that one of his biggest and most daring projects was inspired by going and talking to um, soldiers who, uh, at the time he was talking to them, were in their 70s, 80s, 90s even, um, who had served in the Second World War in the Chinese armies, including actually a story that hadn't been very much told, which I briefly alluded to, which is the Chinese presence in the Burma expedition forces, 1942, and then in 1944. And it's often forgotten that in the Burma campaign of 44, Chinese forces did also participate. And I've been actually down to one of the memorials on the Burma border in southwestern China, where there's now quite extensive commemoration of that. Now, what Sui Yongyuan did was very interesting because he, at that point, was in his late 30s, I want to say. This is in the early 2000s. So, you know, he was born decades after the end of World War II, and he was a young, hip, media savvy figure who, you know, millions and millions of people in China would have known as a, as a media figure. And he decided to make the, well, first of all, specifically the rehabilitation of the nationalist soldiers who, unlike the communists, did not get pensions for their war service, one of his, uh, his causes. And he wanted to put this on his TV show, and the, the state said, no, you can't do this, you know, it's an appropriate story. So he said, fine, because he could take advantage for the first time in the early 2000s, as the rest of the world did, in something which simply wouldn't have existed 10 years before, and that was social media. In other words, he could film these guys telling their story, put it on Chinese social media, which at that point was slightly freer than it is now, and this stuff took off. It was sensational, and lots of young people, I mean, you know, obviously older people were very interested too, but lots of younger people took this up as a story of how this patriotic narrative of China's past had been underplayed and ignored and not really talked about. And actually, the whole thing became so successful that eventually it did get played on mainstream Chinese TV as well. So there were a lot of things mixed up in that, including, obviously, the, the story of justice for these um, unjustly um, uh, rewarded uh, or under-rewarded um, former soldiers, but also a much bigger contemporary debate about what the meaning of Chinese patriotism was how that wartime period related to the much more consumerist but more relatively more peaceful China of the, of the present day. And the social media conversations about this particular set of events were clearly taking part amongst people who were in their you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, who had clearly couldn't have had any personal experience of the Second World War, but were beginning to rediscover it as a set of ideas that helped them think about their present day identity. And what does that identity mean to them? So if they're s searching for something or if there's something about that that is resonating, you know, what is that? Because I'm thinking about here in the United States and we've certainly taught people in the classroom. We have people who come to this museum every day who are young in their teens and their 20s, but they're pulling something from what they see here, also social media, memes and such. So what? In, in China, what is it that the younger generation perhaps is looking for when they turn to that nostalgia to get, it, I guess, to help them through whatever they're moving through at this time? I think, Steph, that there are various things that the younger people in China are getting from it, but if I had to pin down one, I'd say that it gives them a very strong sense of purpose. Because remember what is happening in the real lives of teenagers, 20-somethings in China today. On the one hand, we hear a lot of stories, and there is a great deal to them, of a kind of rising nationalism in China. The idea that China, under the Communist Party, is beginning to take this much more confrontational role in the world, on Taiwan, on the South China Sea, on the border with India, lots of examples, and they're all real. But what often isn't spotted is that for many of China's youth today, and again, social media is a really good place to look for this, a lot of people are very wary about quite where this very strongly nationalistic narrative is going. And one of the best examples of this is um, young people uh, in the last year, basically, not you know, pretty recently, who have been uh, claiming that they want, instead of you know, 
leaping forward as part of this nationalist wave. In their own words, they want to lie flat, and they show pictures of themselves lying on the ground. Uh, and this is symbolically meant to mean that they're not taking part in the rat race. They're not going to go and work for some company that will work them into the ground and uh, pay them uh, pitiful wages uh, because it, in some ways it helps to sort of serve this greater narrative of China growing its, uh, its, its GDP. In that context of a youth that feels in some ways, I think, at least wary of the idea that actually this kind of consumerist growing sense of Chinese identity in which the growth of GDP and the kind of growth of China's presence in the world is simply a good in and of itself. I think for many of them, looking back to the, this imagined idea of the wartime period as one when China had its back against the wall, but people came together to actually fight back against the ex external enemy, at a time when people had to make sacrifices, but sacrifices for a greater end. In a romantic sense, this has a lot of attraction to it. Now, a lot of people, including So Yun Yuan, I've mentioned, have said that if any of these youth were actually forced to do the things that the youth of that generation have been made to do, whether it was fight in these under-equipped Chinese armies, or you know, in many cases find themselves deprived of food and housing and all the comforts of every day, they might not be quite so keen on it. But the point is not that they're realistically looking to go back to those days. The point is that this is creating this idea of what those wartime years of deprivation, deprivation meant that enables them to recreate a sort of romantic, nostalgic view of what uh, of why that past mattered. And to shift forward just a little bit before you know, sort of wrap up and turn it over to audience q and I think an important point of China's good war is also how this memory is playing out on a broader institutional scale. So how might a memory of China's good war be shaping foreign relations or China's broader role in the world? No, that's a really important point to bring up because I've mostly concentrated on how a lot of ordinary people feel about it, but actually there's no getting away from the fact that at the top-down level, at the government level in Beijing and the level of the top think tanks that are advising the government, they are very keen to draw specific uh, cases from China's World War II experience and use them to push present-day claims. So, for instance, in 1943, Winston Churchill, FDR, and Chiang Kai-shek went to Cairo for the Cairo Conference in November that year, uh, the first presence of a Chinese leader alongside the President of the United States and the British Prime Minister at that time. And the communique that was signed at the end of that Cairo Conference is now being used, has some ambiguous phrasing in it about the return of islands uh, after Japan's been defeated to the Republic of China. And today's China uses those as an argument that at Cairo, a whole variety of claims, including particularly the islands, the Diaoyu or Senkaku Islands that sit halfway between Japan and China, should therefore be under Chinese sovereignty. So it's very, very specifically a wartime communique that's being used to, um, uh, to make that case. Just one other example. If you hear Chinese leaders, Xi Jinping, Wang Yi, and others speaking to big international conferences, the UN, Davos, uh, you know, uh, Munich Security Conference, they will very frequently point out in the last five, six, seven years, in a way they wouldn't have done 20 years ago, that China was the first signatory to the UN Charter, even while the end of the war was still going on in April 1945. The point is that China today, in a way that Mao's China did not do and would not have done, wants to lay claim to being a joint creator and therefore a joint owner of the international system that was forged in World War II. In other words, they would make the argument that if the United States gets rights, particularly in Asia and Europe, 70 years plus after the end of World War II because of the sacrifice of American blood and treasure in Asia and Europe, well, in that case, they would argue, China, which also sacrificed huge amounts during World War II, should have exactly the same thing. Whether you agree with that argument is a very different question, but there's no doubt that it's being made very explicitly today in a way that simply wasn't imaginable half a century ago under Chairman Mao, when the narrative about the war, which was really about the Chinese Communist Party and its guerrilla warfare, and had no international dimension to, to speak of, was therefore very, very different. Great, thank you. A, a really excellent reminder of how important history and narrative, and you can even say myth-making might be, for current world events and, and an international order. So thank you, Rana. I'll turn it over to Jeremy for audience Q&A.
Thank you, Rana and Seth. Please raise your hand and I'll get the microphone to you as quickly as I can. We'll start to your left towards the front. One question. Hi, Juan. It's, a, it's an excellent question and one that keeps many people on all sides of the Pacific uh, awake at, uh, 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 at night. Um, by that you mean the question of what's going to happen to you to, to Taiwan. Yeah. Um, I think there is little doubt that in the 2020s, Xi Jinping's government in China has made the unification of Taiwan with the mainland much more of a priority than predecessor presidents of China have done, Jiang Zemin and then Hu Jintao after him. All Chinese leaders on the mainland have considered the question of Taiwan, call it that, to be the last unfinished business of the Cold War. And in fact, you could make an argument, indeed I have made an argument, that one of the primary reasons why Taiwan didn't get to unify with um, the mainland early on, and this is another sign, Steph would put it, of why history is important, is the Korean War. Had it not been for Mao's decision with Stalin and with Kim to invade South Korea in 1950, it seems to me that at that time from the evidence there is a high likelihood that the Truman administration would not have encouraged the communists to take over Taiwan, but they probably wouldn't have stopped it at that point. And it was essentially the outbreak of the Korean War that really changed calculations on that front. So by making that particular move, Mao essentially set the stage for Taiwan to remain separate from the mainland for the decades that, uh, that followed. I think that most analysts who've looked in detail at what a military occupation of Taiwan by China would need would suggest that actually it's not that easy. In terms of, and again, you know, this is a museum which originally started with D-Day, so the question of which beaches to assault and how you do that is something that actually is very relevant to Taiwan as well. Only at certain times of the year and only on certain parts of the island's um, uh, coastline is it possible to launch a major amphibious attack. One of the things that I think would also have changed even the last few uh, weeks because of um, months because of Ukraine is that if there were to be a very large troop buildup on the coast of Fujian province, which there might be, um, it would not be regarded first and foremost, I suspect, as a training exercise in the making, as people thought until February the 23rd uh, in the case of Russia and Ukraine. It would be assumed, I think, that this was the uh, forerunner to an actual um, uh, military operation. But I still think that in the short term, if there are ways in which the mainland can try and bring Taiwan into the fold without launching a military operation, it would still prefer to use those methods. There is, it seems to me, a certain element of what Russia is trying to do with many of its neighbors in which the use of military force is in and of itself supposed to be a demonstration that Russia is a great power. China's preference still, and there's plenty of evidence from that in, in terms of the way it, it's operated in many places, is to try and use economic power, to use its power for electronic um, uh, um, uh, uh, expertise, technological expertise, uh, to subvert um, communications, etc. All of these sorts of things that don't necessarily involve a full-scale military operation, I still think are likely to be preferred tactics, but I think that there is no doubt, and, China itself has been very open about this, that the goal of ending the current status quo, the ambiguous status quo of Taiwan status, is now a much higher priority for leadership in Beijing than would have been the case even a short, uh, short time ago. We're gonna get to your right side in just a moment. Yeah, I, uh, you mentioned that Chinese archives have relatively started to become more open in the last few decades, allowing for new forms of scholarship and new re-envisioning of the Chinese work in Japan. And so I was wondering, 
what do you foresee the future developments in the field becoming as hopefully maybe right uh, more and more files become accessible to historians to analyze and to refine and nuance uh, what we already know and understand about the Chinese contribution and study of the Chinese people. Thanks for a, a great question. Um, one of the things I discuss a little bit in the book, China's Good War, is what continues to be a significant tension between Chinese academics who would essentially like to do much more than they can do even now, and a state which still considers the control of this story to be of the World War II story to be a very important part of its propaganda efforts. So the scholars would like to open many more archives than are open now. I mean, I would say, if you can specify, I think if you asked most Chinese scholars and indeed Western scholars who work on China, which archives that are not open in this area they would like to have opened, they would inevitably say the archives relating to the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party during the war itself. What was Mao saying? What was Zhou Enlai saying? What were they really up to? Yes, there are edited documents, and people have made good use of those, and they, they're worth having, but the fuller panoply of documentation is not open, even though every Chinese scholar you know, who I've privately spoken to unsurprisingly said that they would love to get hold of more of that stuff. And they say that it, in many cases, it's no easier to do so if you're a Chinese scholar in China than it would be for a, uh, for a, for a foreigner. One of the things that I think has been a real plus in terms of international scholars being able to work with Chinese partners is that it has created a much stronger grounds for China to be considered as part of a global war. China essentially does now have to be considered, I think, as part of a much broader panoply of, of study of different, um, uh, different powers in a global war. But it also means that actually that collaboration with overseas scholars I think has been one of the things that has to some extent, even at a very, very, very difficult time uh, for relations between China and the Western world, to keep the door somewhat open in terms of academic collaboration in this area. It's been currently basically held up by the pandemic because as I think you all probably will know, China is continuing to have quarantine restrictions on entry in and out of China, which are now much stronger than in any other country. But I think most of us hope that that would mean that scholarship in this area in World War II is halted for now, but not permanently, and we hope you know, back to something a bit more like normal uh, in a year or two. To your right, halfway back. Uh, good evening. Uh, in your research, when going through uh, primary and secondary sources in particular, how do you sift through a lot of the biases that were going on into those uh, accounts, since pretty much everybody from Peterkin to Davies to Stilwell to Hurley seemed to have some sort of personal axe to grind against their contemporaries. You are right that there are many axes to grind. The China theater of World War II, even now, remains a contentious one in many ways. And you can read books which cover exactly the same period of uh, chronological uh, attention but which have completely different views about what exactly uh, happened. I think the answer to that has to be what I think most historians would, uh, would, would want to do on those topics, which is to read as many sources as you can get hold of and then make a judgment about where you think the correct interpretation comes out in the knowledge that actually some people would disagree quite strongly with where you, uh, you come out on, uh, on there. I do think the specific example I gave, and which you sort of alluded to there again, of having you know, literally the diaries of General Stilwell and Chiang Kai-shek available for exactly the same series of days in the same period is a very good stark example of that because actually it is a good example of how just taking one person's account is rather less than half the story simply because they've got such strong personal prejudices and um, axes to grind. But bringing those two together and then bringing the context of other sorts of documentation that aren't necessarily you know, the personal diaries of the people concerned, but everything from operational records to diplomatic materials and uh, evidence about what was happening in the wider society around them, enable you, I think, to get to some account of the complexity of that, uh, that particular, uh, particular period. Question in the front row to your left, please. Well, we're in 
Louisiana, so somebody's got to ask you about your assessment of Claire Chenault. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, Claire Chenault certainly turns up in the, uh, in the story, and so do the Flying Tigers, of course. Um, I think that, um, the, and again, many people will be here will be familiar with some of these debates, but very briefly speaking, the Americans who were involved in the China theater had very different ideas about what was the right thing to do in terms of keeping China in the war and ultimately making it part of a, a victorious alliance. And put very simply, Stilwell was a land guy and Chenault was an air guy, uh, not least because of the, the particular uh, military backgrounds that each had, uh, had had, which led them ultimately to, to, to China. I think the question you asked, which is the assessment of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, what I think of Chenault, was that um, his stress on air power was certainly important in terms, particularly in the early period when Japanese air raids were destroying large parts of um, uh, China's um, unoccupied zone. Uh, things like air raids on the temporary capital at, uh, at Chongqing, that this was an immensely important contribution. But overall, neither Chenault nor Stilwell, I think, had enough of the big picture of how China itself was rapidly changing in the circumstances of the war. And to give one specific example of what I mean by that, I don't think either of them really had a very clear idea of exactly what the growing communist insurgency in northwest China, which actually is one of the most significant changes to have happened in China during those years, really meant in terms of the kind of state that China was going to, uh, going to be. So at least they had in common, and again, actually, considering they hated each other, this war, well, <laughs> found, found, found life very difficult with each other, to, to, to put it mildly. They both thought that China was important in the war. They both actually thought that China had a role to play. And that wasn't a view that was necessarily shared by all of those, broadly speaking, who were uh, in command in the, the Asian, uh, Asian theaters. A final note on Chenault, again, is maybe well known, but worth throwing in. After the war, he married a, um, uh, a young Chinese woman, uh, Chen Xiangmei in Chinese, Anna Chenault, as she was known in, uh, um, uh, in English. She became quite a player in Republican um, uh, politics here in the US in the 50s and 60s, the so-called China lobby. What's less well known is that she, I mean, after her importance in American politics really faded after Nixon's visit to China, but she then actually became for a while really very well known in Chinese politics. Even though she was married to one of the great supporters of the nationalist Kuomintang government, in the 90s and 2000s, because of her connection to Chenault and because of the, her connection to that World War II story, even by proxy, because she, she was not married to him during the, the war, she was welcomed back on a very regular basis in China itself. She wrote many collections of essays and memoirs that were published in China only in, in, in Chinese and actually became a very, very respected figure. So that's one of the things that World War II and this idea of a shared history was able to do during that period about 20, 25 years ago, that it brought together people across the communist, nationalist, political divide who could say that they disagreed about those issues, but that the fight against Japan had in some ways brought them together. And she and also her late husband were an important part of that story. Rana, we have a question in the front to your right. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Minner. I think I've seen you in dozens of uh, documentaries and lectures by now, but um, there's one question that I've never seen you answer, and that is, how did you become a China historian? Um, I wish the answer was that I had a bad night in Las Vegas, which went wrong, and I had to fulfill a bet. Um, thank you for the question. <sighs> All I can say is that when I was um, 17 and had to apply to study a particular subject in, in, in high school, uh, sorry, from high school to, to university, and for those who don't know the British system, unlike the US where for a first degree quite often you do you know, a different range of subjects and then major in something, in Britain it's kind of all or nothing. You do one subject for three or four years and, and nothing else, so you know, physics or uh, English literature or indeed Chinese. And growing up in Britain, on the south coast of Britain, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. I think my interest in studying Chinese, including the Chinese language in particular, stemmed from a desire to actually take up something that 
had absolutely nothing to do with anything I knew anything about whatsoever. Um, so I was saying to, earlier to, to Steph off the, uh, the record, I hate you by putting on the record, Steph, that I'm not a great fan of the idea that people should stay in their lanes. I'm quite keen on wandering into lanes that have nothing to do with me and seeing what, uh, what goes on in them. And then having learned Chinese, for me it seemed that it seemed that one of the most interesting areas for exploration was modern Chinese history because compared to some fields, modern British history being an example, which had seemed really very well covered by that stage and people often asking versions of the same question over and over again, there were huge swathes of even quite recent Chinese history that simply weren't very well covered, at least in the English language literature. Um, and as it turned out, the period surrounding World War II has certainly been one of those uh, periods, although it's by no means the only uh, only one. So I would say that it was a sort of slightly random curiosity that probably took me in that direction, but it's been immensely rewarding for you know far more years than I care to remember, and I expect it to remain so for quite some time to come. Ron, I'm gonna ask the last question. Quick answer, what's next and when? I've become very interested in the aftermath of the Second World War, which of course is the period of the Chinese Civil War, but it's also a period from 1945 to 49, a period that's often considered a kind of last coda of the old regime before the communists come to power. In fact, it's a lot more than that. It's a period which is actually China's first attempt to globalize. It's when China joins the United Nations for the first time. It's also a time when China tries to weave and duck weave between the new major powers of the world while creating its own vision for what Asia is going to be. And it's also a time when lots of young people whose diaries I've been reading, men and women, think about the very central question of what it is to be Chinese, to be revolutionary, to be young, to be male, to be female, all these things often in kind of tentative and sometimes um, rather um, hesitant ways, thinking about who they are. So. I am interested in the period of the Chinese Civil War, but I'm interested in, in it as a way of understanding how an entire society changes at that time, not just in terms of the war itself, but the effects it has on changing a society, just as I have been interested in the same questions when it comes to China's Second World War experience. So that's where I hope to go, Jeremy, and I hope there'll be a new book on that out within the uh, next um, couple, of, um, uh, uh, couple, of, uh, couple of years, we'll, 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 come to, we'll, we'll hope to see. Well, we'll have you back down when it's ready. Thank you to Ron Emitter and Steph Hennerships. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. Uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, kind of tour de force uh, by, by our team here. And, uh, you know, Keep an eye out for our, our next event. Uh, we haven't haven't scheduled the next one yet, but we, we certainly will make sure everyone's aware of that as we move forward. But uh, please join me in a, an, another round of applause for Ron and staff. Thank you very much. So, so Ron will be to the left after this, where it says author book signing. Uh, if, if you'd care to uh, to queue up there and, and everybody else, uh, thank you very much. It's great to see you. and. Look forward to seeing you again next time.